and as well today. <clears throat> okay, uh, so last time uh, we uh, finished up a little bit talking about um, really kind of phase changes and sort of what is going on uh, during phase changes. We talked about sort of the energy required to do those phase changes. Uh, so remember that, you know, when we do go from say something like solid to liquid, uh, liquid to gas, or, you know, even solid directly to gas, skipping the whole liquid uh, sort of phase, that, you know, these things do occur pretty much at the same temperature. So, you know, when we're doing melting and freezing, it occurs at exactly the same temperature. Uh, for example, as we talked about, zero degrees Celsius there for waters when that occurs. And at exactly zero degrees Celsius, you have both phases, which are known as being in equilibrium with each other, which means um, you got some liquid, you got some sort of ice in the case of water sort of happening at the same time. It's not really until we get sort of uh, above zero degrees Celsius for water that we do get sort of liquid water, not until we're below zero degrees Celsius that we do get uh, sort of solid that occurs. Uh, same thing happens as we do that sort of liquid to uh, sort of gas transition back and forth. Uh, we have basically that occurring at the same temperature. Again, for water, that would be 100 degrees Celsius. And again, exactly at 100 degrees Celsius, we have both phases that are basically occurring at the same time. Um, there's a certain amount of heat and energy required, again, just to do those transitions. So we talked about the heat of fusion, which is basically the energy sort of needed to do the solid to liquid or liquid to solid sort of transition. And we also talked about the heat of uh, heat of vaporization, I'll spit that out, right? Or the delta H of vaporization, which again is that energy required to do the transition between our liquid and gas state going back and forth. Remember, as we go from say solid to liquid to gas, those are all sort of endothermic type processes in terms of energy. We do have to put heat and energy in. Again, we have things in the solid, more energy, they can kind of move past each other, get into the liquid phase, more energy, they can kind of escape uh, the liquid phase into the gas phase and vice versa. Exothermic are negative values for energy as you kind of go backwards, going from gas to liquid, you lose energy. Uh, those gas molecules no longer have enough energy to kind of get away from each other. They kind of stick if you want to think about it that way. Uh, they kind of fall into the liquid phase. You continue to remove energy, give off energy, uh, then we transition from kind of a liquid state. They no longer have enough energy even to pass each other. And that becomes sort of a solid state. That sort of transition into our talk of these diagrams that sort of help us uh, understand the relationship for different substances um, in terms of pressure and temperature sort of relationships. And these are what are sometimes referred to as phase diagrams, one of which we're looking at here on the screen, which is where we finished last time. Uh, I believe this was for carbon dioxide, which is basically dry ice. On a phase diagram, it has basically, you know, several points along the way that are important. Obviously, usually going kind of left to right there is our solid, liquid, and gas sort of arrangement. Uh, we have lines that basically separate those guys. Um, and those are where we find our transitions that occur. So obviously, going from solid to liquid uh, would follow you know, the line that's sort of between those guys here. And uh, that's where we would have obviously melting and freezing occurring depending on sort of which way you're going. Uh, it would occur at 100, 100 degrees, one atmosphere. Since it's carbon dioxide, that's why we go right into gas, but uh, that transition there and obviously solid to gas would be our sublimation liquid to gas or evaporation and going backwards. There's a couple important points here that we talked about last time on these phase diagrams. Uh, one is was referred to as the triple point, which is this guy right here. And that's basically the sort of pressure temperature relationship at which uh, pretty much all three phases are occurring at once. So you have your solid, uh, your liquid and your gas basically happening at the same time. Uh, there's also what is sometimes referred to as the critical point. And at the critical point, that's where we find our critical temperature and pressure. And that's that guy right there. And that's basically the point where, as you can see past there, that's essentially where we get a substance that basically kind of has a liquid sort of properties, but also flows sort of like a gas over here. And that's what is sometimes referred to as the supercritical fluid. Um, is basically that guy right there. 
we could use these like we did here to basically figure out uh, what combination uh, we would expect things to be in under certain temperature and pressures. It also explains to us, for example, like dry ice under normal conditions, which is one atmosphere coming across here. Uh, it does go from, in terms of temperature, at that one atmosphere directly from solid to gas, skipping the whole liquid part, which is over here. And that's why we've used dry ice or you've seen dry ice, which I'm sure you probably have. Uh, again, it basically is super cold. Um, then as it sort of warms up, if you will, to room temperature, uh, we get that transition directly to gas, which is going through sublimation. And again, no liquid cleanup in that part. As we talked about, if you wanted to sort of force it into a liquid state, you would need to get, again, your pressure above 5.1 at least. And again, your temperature in sort of this region here to kind of force it into liquid. And that's about, you know, five times, more than five times probably, um, the pressure that we normally, you know, sort of have, which is about one atmosphere. So that's why, again, under sort of normal conditions, we don't see things like dry ice, for example, in that liquid phase. Any questions on any of the stuff we talked about the last time? <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna kind of continue talking a little bit more about sort of uh, water, for example. Uh, we talked about, again, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, for example, ice and in the ice, this is a good little display of it. In the solid form, liquid water creates a lot of open sort of areas as they bond with each other through hydrogen bonding that creates a very kind of low density for ice versus liquid water and that's why again typically ice will float so if you know you're kind of skating along here uh, you got all these kind of liquid water molecules, which allows for your blade to go through, but you do have sort of this solid ice there, um, which is sort of the foundation for that kind of liquidy part. So if you've ever seen like a hockey or an ice skating ring, right? You always look at the top part, it's kind of like watery, but the other part is hopefully relatively sort of sturdy and strong and sort of solid. Now, a little bit more about water, some of the properties we've talked about. Uh, water obviously covers a lot of our world here. Uh, it has a large thermal conductivity and highest surface tension. Um, most of the properties is due to hydrogen bonding for water. It's why certain things are soluble in water, uh, why certain things mix with water, also why certain things don't mix with water. And as we talked about before, um, you know, the density of ice, which is sort of an unusual property, most substances in their sort of solid phase are usually more dense than in their liquid phase. Water is an exception for that. And again, as we just saw in that previous picture, it's that really hydrogen bonding that occurs is those big open areas that happen between the different water molecules. Again, remembering that kind of density is mass over volume. So you're creating a lot of this open space, if you were, or open volume between all these uh, water molecules, increasing the volume part of this calculation, uh, decreasing the density here uh, that we see here. For the most part, liquid water is considered to have a uh, sort of density of one gram per mil. Density does change with temperature. So depending on the temperature, the density of, of an object will change as you saw with the gas, right? So depending on sort of the temperature, for example, of your gas, you'll have a different density value when you look it up in those tables. Same sort of thing happens with anything uh, that involves density. It does sort of change with uh, sort of temperature. And a lot of that is through that hydrogen bonding uh, that we talked about and sort of how they interact with each other. Um, and that's really how one water molecule interacts with another one through hydrogen bonding, which is, as we talked about, it is a bond between hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. These kind of three really electronegative atoms. And obviously in water, we actually have two of those bonds where the hydrogen is more positive, oxygen is more negative here. And that gives us some intermolecular force, which is our hydrogen bonding, and a way these guys can basically interact with each other again through that sort of opposites attract making that hydrogen bond 
uh, that's happening between one water molecule basically and another, as we can see here. And remember that is the relatively strongest intermolecular force that we talked about. We talked about three major categories of sort of intermolecular forces. There was hydrogen bonding, which is really the strongest. There was dipole dipole, which is also relatively strong. And remember the weakest out of all those guys was those dispersion forces. Those were sort of the more temporary type forces. Remember, this is the major force for nonpolar molecules and nonpolar molecules sort of coming together. Dipole, dipole is basically how polar molecules and polar molecules come together that cannot hydrogen bond. And really hydrogen bonding is a type of dipole dipole, but uh, it is also between polar molecules and polar molecules that can hydrogen bond. So obviously that's the kind of distinction that we have between them. Now, when we sort of think about water and, and sort of this property of it, when we sort of put water and it starts to freeze, it takes up uh, a little bit more volume in the solid than it is liquid. And you probably have seen this, maybe you've even done this. Sometimes a lot of times people will take like, you know, a can of soda or something like that. And it's, you know, kind of warm. So you throw it in the freezer and you sort of forget about the, the soda and you come back and you look at it and the bottom kind of looks like, you know, it's coming out the bottom part there starting to expand. And that's really right. Your soda basically has a lot of water molecules in there. When you freeze it, it goes from this sort of arrangement here to this arrangement here where they all start to kind of spread out. Clearly, if it's in a container like a jar or even, you know, like a aluminum can there for your soda, it's got nowhere to go. So it's going to start to, you know, kind of expand out the bottom of your container. And obviously if it's glass, that's not so good because it probably will break in that particular case. Um, and again, that's it because as those water molecules really come together in that solid phase, we start to get a lot more volume being taken up and again, that volume needs to go pretty much somewhere and it will try to expand out as best it can. And again, that's from that really unusual property as we've been talking about of water having a, a much higher dense, or lower density in the solid form than in the liquid form. Also important sort of that aspect of water as to sort of how things freeze or how water freezes so when water freezes, um, it actually freezes kind of from the top down, which is kind of good for, you know, uh, wildlife that's living in the water and stuff like that. You know, so what ends up happening is basically liquid has its sort of highest density um, at about four degrees Celsius. So as the water sort of cools, the cooler water has a lower density, which means it's going to float to the surface. So as that kind of cooler water floats to the surface, it starts to basically freeze. And what that means is really it creates sort of an insulated sort of situation where the warmer water will kind of work its way down that kind of four degrees water, right? And that's good because obviously fishes and stuff like that that are swimming around can basically be okay down underneath because that's sort of where the warmer water would be, right? Um, be a much worse case, obviously, if it froze from the bottom up, that means anything living on the bottom would be basically popsicles, right? As it would freeze from the bottom up in that case. So, you know, sort of this density of water works very well, you know, in this sort of situation. Uh, the greatest density of water is about four degrees and it's about one gram per milliliter, uh, also one gram per cubic centimeter. Remember that a milliliter and a cubic centimeter are essentially the same. So that works really well again for our sort of sea life, like our good friend here, Melvin, right? You never know, that might be on the test. What is the fish's name, which is Melvin here. And although he does look like he's in an ice cube, he, imagine he's not in an ice cube. That's just really old cut and paste type of thing, but he's floating around happy. 
And again, because that kind of warmer water is coming down, the cooler water is coming up here, freezing, sort of creating an insulated type situation. And again, uh, freezing really from the kind of the top down, allowing obviously sea life and everything like that to sort of continue below the surface. You know, unless somebody decides they want to go ice fishing, I suppose, and cut a hole in it, then that's not so good for, you know, fishes and stuff like that, I suppose. But, um, you know, this is sort of, you know, the idea how lakes freeze and water freezes in those kind of big areas. Any questions on water, liquid, solids, or I guess solutions? All right, so now we're going to kind of transition a little bit and talk just a little bit about uh, solids and some aspects of solids and sort of how they come together uh, in the solid state and some similarities and differences depending on sort of what comes together. So solids, as we know, again, is the state of matter where things are pretty much packed in there, pretty tight to each other. They're usually very dense. There's usually not a lot of room, obviously water being an exception to that. Uh, things are typically packed in very close to each other. Uh, there's really two types of solids that we're going to talk about. One's a crystalline solid. And these guys, you know, like sort of ionic compounds, they have very long range sort of order that occurs when those guys kind of come into the solid phase. They all kind of line up in a very organized sort of repeating pattern, uh, which means, as we will talk about here in just a second, you literally could take just almost a snapshot of a little piece of sort of the uh, solid structure. And it's such a repeatable pattern that you could kind of put it all back together by just taking that one little piece and kind of sticking them all back together and recreate sort of the three-dimensional structure of that solid as to how it kind of comes together. There's also amorphous solids, uh, which exhibit sort of the opposite of that. They really exhibit very little sort of long range order. Uh, they do have definite shapes and are hard. Uh, things like glass are considered amorphous solid, um, organic polymers and so forth. But they do lack a lot of that sort of really ordered arrangement of how everybody uh, sort of comes together. Now, how things sort of come together and how they're attracted. And we're gonna kind of focus in on the crystalline solids here. And those crystalline solids, they make this what is sometimes referred to as a, a crystal lattice. And this crystal lattice is basically the arrangement of those sort of molecules and atoms in three dimensional space. When they do come together, as we talked about a little bit earlier when we were talking about sort of intermolecular forces, because there's different sort of guys coming together in that sense, there are going to always sort of have an area where you are going to get some positive sides, for example, of a molecule and some negative sides sort of coming together, especially with ions, right? You got some positive ions, you got some negative ions coming together, but they do try to, again, minimize energy, right? Everything in chemistry is all about lowest energy is most stable, highest energy, not so good. So what they end up doing is as they come together and sort of the solid is they start moving around, kind of moving around, adjusting their sort of locations to a place where they can sort of be happy. They're maybe near more of the opposite sort of charges, so positives near negatives, uh, but there's still some positives near positives and negatives near negatives, but they really do try to kind of move around a lot to minimize uh, that sort of a repulsion forces that occur. And this arrangement of these particles are what are referred to as a crystal lattice. And you can, as I was just sort of uh, talking about a second ago, within this sort of really ordered arrangement, you could pull out a section of that, which is a pattern that basically continues to repeat. And that is, as it says on the bottom there, that is what is referred to as a unit cell. So you literally, like I said, could take a section of that solid and just from that one little section, there's such order that occurs that you can rebuild, you know, the whole sort of 3D structure. So, for example, if we look at unit cells, it's really important in terms of how we select our unit cell, what we would want to kind of use as our unit cell. So let's say, for example, you know, we had all these solids like it's on the bottom there. 
Uh, but, you know, we had all these circle guys and they're in the solid uh, sort of state here. Award-winning drawing of circles here. And let's say we wanted to pick something to use as our unit cell. Now, you may say to yourself, well, it would kind of make sense to pick a circle since, you know, I want to pick a circle here as sort of my unit cell. And if you did sort of pick one of those circles, which could represent an atom or a molecule, and use that as your unit cell, you definitely did get the structure of that one particular sort of atom or molecule or whatever it may be. But there's a problem with that. And the problem with selecting kind of the whole guy is it gives us no reference point to its neighbors. We're not really sure where we should put the next circle. Should we put it to the left? Should we put it to the right? Is it just off center a little bit? You know, there's really no reference point to sort of how this particular atom, for example, is sort of connected to the one that's next to it. So if we were going to choose a unit cell, we probably wouldn't want to choose, you know, something like that. A better sort of way to sort of choose, you know, what to use as a unit cell is what happens if we kind of took that guy and eh, we'll go with purple. And we decided we'll just kind of take a square that involves portions of four different atoms. So if we pull that out as our unit cell, what we would end up with is something that kind of looks like this. Although we don't have a whole sort of atom there, we now have part of four atoms. But the nice thing about that is that it gives us some relationship of how everybody else is connected. We know that if we throw our next box right next to it, we will end up with you know, the same sort of deal. And if we threw perhaps another unit cell below it, we'll end up with the same sort of guy. And if we put one next to it as well, we'll end up with the same guy. And now you can kind of see by having that frame of reference to sort of how it's connected to its neighbors, you can very easily here use these unit cells and really reconstruct that whole sort of 3D structure like we see over here. Again, not really sure for this guy how we could do that. So typically when we kind of pull something out as a unit cell, what we're looking for is the relationship obviously of the atoms, but also of sort of their neighbors as well. So we want to be able to sort of focus in on the neighbors. So if we have this sort of 3D structure here, if we pulled out that guy as our unit cell, we have a lot of information. Again, we have information about, you know, corners of four atoms. And we know within the corners of these four atoms, we actually have a whole atom that's part of the sort of 3D structure. So as we would be putting it back together, we would get that relationship. And again, you could recreate the whole thing. Here again, you see the same idea. You have basically parts of those atoms. And again, within it is a guy in the center. So we wanna make sure when we sort of choose unit cells that you know we do get some relationships uh, between both the actual atoms that are there and how they're related to everybody that's next to them. Any questions on that there? These are different types of unit cells. As you can see, there's a lot of different types of unit cells. Um, there's cubic, tetragono, all those kind of guys. We're gonna focus in on fairly simple sort of cubic cells. We're gonna actually do unit cells that are cubic where everybody is pretty much 90 degrees. Uh, we won't get into all the rest of these guys. Uh, we will focus in just on these sort of guys here. And there's actually a few different types of cubic unit cells that we'll talk about uh, when we look at it. Now, unit cells and sort of how things are sort of connected to each other, uh, the number of particles that are in contact with one another is what is known as the coordination number. For ions, it is a number that's oppositely charged ions that are in contact with it. Sort of the higher the coordination number, it means more interactions. Therefore, we get a stronger attractive force 
holding that guy together. So because coordination numbers related to how many guys are in direct contact with each other, these are things that are sort of attracted to each other. The more attractive guys we have, the stronger it's going to be. Uh, something that we won't get too much into is what's referred to as packing efficiency. And that's sort of the percentage of volume the unit cell occupies by the particles. The higher the coordination number, the more efficient the particles are packed together. Again, there's kind of more ways that they kind of incorporate with each other or kind of uh, come in contact with each other with that higher sort of um, coordination number. So focusing on cubic unit cells, a couple of important things about a cubic unit cell. First off, uh, all the angles are basically 90 degrees, so right angles. Uh, the length of all the edges are equal to each other. Now, a unit cell could be made up of spherical particles, and what ends up happening is if we get some of those particles kind of in the corner, it represents an eighth of an atom. So if you think about a, a cube, and I'll do my really bad drawing here, right? We'll kind of draw a, a sort of cube, if you will, ish. There's basically one eighth of an atom on all of the corners of a cubic unit cell. If you count up all the corners, that is eight corners. One eighth of an atom in each of the corners would represent one whole atom that's there, right? Basically, you got an eighth of it in each of those guys. Uh, we get a half of a particle if it's on the face. So, you know, if you had an atom that's sort of on the face of it, it would be kind of split in half, as you could kind of imagine, um, to the other cube that would be on the other side. So you get kind of a half an atom on each of those. And you get a fourth of an atom, uh, which in the edge of uh, the cube as well. So when we try to find the volume of a cube, and a lot of things that we will sort of uh, come across is uh, we're gonna be asked to find things like density, which is grams per cubic centimeter. Cubic centimeter is a volume, right? And to find the volume of a cube, you basically take the length, the edge length cubed, right? So that is going to be equal to the volume here. We probably won't come across too much spheres, but that's how you figure out the volume of a sphere. Four thirds pi r cubed, r being the radius in that particular case. But we will again be dealing strictly with really cubes. Uh, so we'll be using the volume is that length that is cubed. So let's talk about the three different types of cubic unit cells. And we're gonna go through each of these sort of individually here in just a second. But let's talk about some of the important aspects of each of these. Uh, this first one is a simple cubic unit cell, sometimes abbreviated with SC for simple cubic. It has basically one atom, whole atom, that is part of that unit cell. And that's because here there's an eighth of an atom in each of the corners. One eighth and eight corners gives you one whole atom. It has a coordination number of six, so it comes in contact in six different locations. And important to calculate the length, it is two times r, r being the radius. And it could pack in there about 52%. The next type of cubic cell that we'll talk about is body-centered cubic, sometimes abbreviated BCC for body-centered cubic. This guy also, like you see above, has those eight atoms our eighth of an atom in each of the corners. That is one whole atom. And body-centered means that if you look kind of right here, and we'll see a picture of it in just a sec as well, there's a whole intact atom that's in the center of those eight little guys. And that means one atom for all the corners and one whole intact atom sitting dead center of that cubic cell. And that gives us a grand total of two atoms for every body-centered cubic unit cell. To calculate the length of it, it is four times the radius divided by the square root of three, it has a coordination number of eight, and you can see the packing efficiency gets much better. So as we talked about sort of the higher the coordination number, the better things will sort of come together 
and the tighter they'll be able to sort of pack together in terms of in the solid state. The last type of unit cell we're going to talk about is face centered and that is abbreviated FCC for face centered cubic. Now this guy also has the eighth of an atom in each of the corners, so that's like one atom. Here it kind of looks like there's a whole atom on the sides and there are. There's basically a whole atom on every side here. Remember that if you have an atom sort of on the side, you get pretty much a half of atom. And if we look at sort of how many sides we have, um, and you get a half atom, there are six different sides to a cube. And each side has a half atom, basically six divided by two is three. So from everybody that's sitting on the face, this face centered guy will end up with four total atoms per cubic cell as the most sort of coordination number because you got everybody in there uh, sort of coming in contact with each other. And it has the best sort of efficiency in terms of packing because there's a lot of, again, interactions between everybody. The length here is equal to, sometimes you'll see it sort of on the outside just to make sure it is two times the square root of two times r, or sometimes you'll see people write it two r times the square root of two, uh, but the r is not underneath the square root. It kind of looks like it, but it's really not underneath the square root there. And again, uh, that would be how you would calculate it. So really important for sort of the calculations we're gonna talk about here is understanding for the different types of cubic cells, uh, unit cells, um, how many atoms there are. So that's really important. So simple cubic one, body centered two, and face centered four total atoms. And we'll see how that's worked into the calculation here in just a second. But let's take a look at each of these a little bit closer so we can uh, sort of see what's happening here. And here again, this is our simple cubic. And our simple cubic again has a total of one atom in each of those cells. Again, there's an eighth of an atom in each of these corners. And you can see there's eight different corners, including the guy down there. And that gives us one whole atom. Um, it is two times R. The length is twice the radius. So the length here is two times R. And that's really important, again, uh, for some of the calculations that we're going to do. So understanding these two things for this type of unit cell is really important. How many total atoms and how to calculate the length is very important in these calculations. Here's just sort of a sliced out picture of that. And again, here you can see that sort of eighth of an atom in each of those corners coordination number of six, again, how they're interacting with each other, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Here's sort of our six interactions that are happening between each of these sort of atoms as they all kind of come together in the solid sort of state. And uh, again, uh, this is important, which is our length is equal to two times R. Now body centered, as we talked about there a second ago, has a coordination number of eight. Again, it has a total of two atoms here. Again, in our body centered, two atoms, which are important. Again, uh, having that uh, eighth of an atom in each of the corners for a grand total of basically one atom for all these guys. And the guy down here. And then we have one whole atom right here in the center. And that again gives us our two atoms that we have for this guy. Um, I'm not sure what square root died there. But the length is equal to four divided by the square root of three for R also missing for r times the square root of three divided by the square root of three i'll spit that out right there you go for r divided by the square root of three uh, gives it there and again you can see within this sort of cube that's our whole atom sitting there in the dead center and if we were going to take that unit cell again we take that kind of corners 
which has given us the eighth of an atom in each of the corners. And again, our full atom happening right there dead center when we pull out that unit cell. And there, as you can see, a much better picture. Um, we see our whole atom in the middle, our eighth of an atom on each of the corners. And our interactions as they go through here, that's what these sort of lines are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight sort of interactions that are happening. So again, the more interactions that you have, the higher the coordination number, and really the better everybody sort of associates with each other and how they're able to sort of pack themselves there into the solid state. And here's a prettier picture, I suppose, of what I just did there. And lastly, the last unit cell that we've been talking about here, good talk, uh, is uh, um, our face centered. And on our face centered, this is where we have our square root is like off by itself there. Try that again. Um, again, we have the eighth of an atom in each of these. These are basically a whole atom that's on the edge or the face of each of these squares. Again, those are going to get pretty much slop right there in the middle. You get a half atom on each of the faces. So as I mentioned before, there's basically six sort of faces to a cube. Each one will have a half atom that's been cut pretty much straight in half. And the corners will have that eighth of an atom. So here with our face centered, the important part is we will end up with four total atoms. And also the length here is 2r times the square root of 2. And you can see a much better picture there. Again, each of those intact atoms on the edge or the face of it is going to get pretty much sliced right in half. Half will stay with that unit cell. Half would obviously go to the unit cell on the other side there. And um, that's, again, how we get basically our three atoms from each of the faces there. All right, so let's then talk about really, um, you know, some calculations here and go through sort of a calculation together as to, you know, how we're going to solve for some of these things. So first off, if we uh, wanted to calculate the density of aluminum, uh, <clears throat> if it crystallizes in a face centered and has a radius of 143 picometers, so a couple important things here. First off, we want to find the density, which is mass divided by volume. This is essentially grams divided by cubic centimeters. So when you're doing these type of problems, you essentially can think about these in terms of, I need to get both of those units. I need to get the grams and I need to get the cubic centimeters, which is the volume. So first off, we know that it is face centered, which means that as we just saw there, FCC first off means it has four atoms that are in that unit cell. We also know that the length of it will be two times R square root of two. So how can we get the volume? The volume of these cubes, as we've talked about, the volume is the length cubed. So we need to calculate that length. We also need to get to the grams part. So we're gonna start with the grams part. The grams part's actually not too bad. So the grams part comes from this piece of information here. So because we know it is a face centered, we know that the unit cell will have four atoms. So we just think about logically how we get from basically atoms to grams. How do we get from atoms to grams? Well, hopefully we know atoms keyword there is Avogadro's number is going to be involved. So we do need to use Avogadro's number here, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole, right? Once we could do that, we will then have moles and they go from moles to grams. We hopefully know that that conversion is the molar mass, right, from the periodic table. And we can simply look up, uh, we're doing aluminum here, uh, which is 2698 grams per mole. So any questions on that part so far? 
So we can use how many atoms are in this unit cell to get us to the grams that are there. So we'll start with that part of the calculation. We have four atoms of aluminum. And again, we know that because it's face centered. Using Avogadro's number correctly here, we want atoms to cancel out. So 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole. And if we do that, uh, that is four divided by 6.022 to the 23, going to give us something like 6.64 times 10 to the minus 24 moles of aluminum. Now that we have the moles of aluminum, we can use the molar mass of aluminum to convert from moles to grams. So we would multiply by 2698 grams per mole of aluminum. And if we do that, 26.98 gets us 1.79 times 10 to the minus 22 grams. Any questions on that calculation, where any of the numbers came from? So this number, believe it or not, small number here, is the grams part that we need there from for our density. So we really have just calculated pretty much half of what we need. So the next part of what we need is going to come from sort of the length that's there and sort of the volume. So remember that volume is length cubed. And we know that the length of this guy is two times R, which is the radius. They gave us the radius, which is 143 picometers. So at this point, uh, we can do one thing. We could do a conversion. We could wait to do a conversion. But at some point, if you look at the units we're looking for, for density, it's, it's cubic centimeters. So we're in picometers. At some point, you kind of want to convert to centimeters so you could be in the right units. So you could do that at the beginning, you could do that at the end, but we'll wait here just a second. We do have the radius, so we're going to put that in. So the length is going to be two times the radius, which is 143 picometers times the square root of two. And if we do that, that's going to be uh, two times 143 times the square root of two. Yeah, it looks like perhaps we end up with 404.67, we'll call it, 404.67. And the units here are still picometers because I have not done a conversion. I do wanna do a conversion. So pico basically means uh, 10 to the minus 12. That means that in one picometer, there is 10 to the minus 12 meters. So I could use that as a conversion here. And again, the purpose of doing this is so I could get it to centimeters. So eventually I could get it to cubic centimeters. So again, one picometer is 10 to the minus 12 meters. We don't want meters, but we do want centimeters. So remember there's a hundred centimeters in one meter. So we could use that as a conversion as well. One meter is a hundred centimeters. Meters will cancel, picometers will cancel, gives us 'm going to put minus scientific notation if you don't then you'll probably end up with a bunch of zeros and a four at the end of your calculator if you have it in scientific notation you'll end up with 4.04 .04 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters again if you're in sort of non-scientific notation you probably have a bunch of zeros and it just ends with a four which is the same thing now you may be thinking that's a lot of conversions that's clearly my volume Again, it is not your volume, it is only the length. This is where we're going to use now for a cube to turn our volume, I'm sorry, to turn our length into a volume. So you gotta cube it. So the volume here is the length cubed. And this is again, really why I converted it to centimeters 
because now when I put this number in here and I cube it, I end up first off with a number that is, and we'll call it 6.62 times 10 to the minus 23. But the centimeters now get cubed into cubic centimeters. And remember a cubic centimeter is a volume, right? And now what does that number represent? Well, that number right there represents the volume part that we need. So this number right here that we just got represents really the bottom part that we need there for our density, which means pretty much at this point, we have everything that we need to calculate the density of this guy so we're going to take the density here is equal to our mass, which was the 1.79 times 10 to the minus 22 grams, divided by our volume, which is there in green, 6.62 times 10 to the minus 23 cubic centimeters. It's density, so the units will not cancel each other out. So 1.79, making sure you use your exponent button, 6.62 two to the minus 23. Looks like we end up with 2.70, go right about there, 2.70 grams per cubic centimeters. That is a long way to go uh, to get to the density here. Any questions on any of those sort of steps there along the way? So these are very common sort of questions involving unit cells uh, asked to solve for the density. You could be given the density, you may be asked to solve for what is the cell length, uh, you know, what is the volume, what is the mass, you know, you, or how many atoms, you know, those type of things or sort of variations on it. Any questions on any of those steps? Okay, now that I did one, why don't you try one here and see what you come up with. So why don't you try this one here? That is the one we just did. So don't try that one. Hopefully you'll get the same answer. Let's see. I think there's another one. All right, why don't you try uh, rubidium here is body centered cubic and it uh, has a radius of 247.5 um, picometers. So see what you come up with. Uh, rubidium is uh, where we have there in terms of molar mass. In case you don't have a periodic table, 8547. 8547 grams per mole is rubidium. And again, a reminder that pico is 10 to the minus 12. All right, so take a few minutes here and see what you come up with. We're looking for the density here in grams per cubic centimeter. So see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So again, a couple of different things going on here in this particular one. Uh, first off, they do tell us it is body centered. So that is, again, something different than the previous one we looked at. So body centered cubic, which is BCC, that's that guy where it essentially has, you know, atoms in the corners and body centered means it's got that full atom sort of sitting there in the, in the middle. And that means that it does have two atoms total in that sort of unit cell. And again, that's why it's important to know how many atoms come with those three different types of unit cells. Also important because it's not the same one as the previous one. The length here is calculated differently as 4R divided by the square root of 3. So also very important uh, to make sure that you kind of have those two pieces of information sort of handy for you in order to uh, sort of calculate this correctly. We're going to kind of approach it the same way. We're looking for the density. So again, we're looking for the grams and we're looking for the volume here. So I'm just going to start with the uh, grams like we did previously. In this case, though, we have two atoms, which we then want to use Avogadro's number there uh, to convert us into moles. 
And once we have moles, we could use the molar mass to go from moles to grams. And again, from the periodic table, 8547 grams of RB. And if we do all that calculation right there, that's going to get us to times 8547 divided by 6.022 to the 23 gun to yield dust looks like maybe 2.84 times 10 to the minus 22 grams of rubidium. And again, that will be our top number that we need. So that is the grams part there. So what's left is uh, now to figure out the volume. The volume will come from really the length and the radius there. So we're going to start with a couple of things here. Uh, we can, if you want up front, convert this guy to centimeters because again, at some point you need to do that conversion. Um, if you want, you could do that right up front or again, you can wait to the end, it should come out the same. So just to show you, if we do it up front, we could take 247.5 picometers. Again, here using the conversion that a picometer is 10 to the minus 12 meters. And again, we want centimeters. So there are a hundred centimeters in a meter. Meters cancel, picometers cancel. Going to get us 247.5 to the minus 12 times 100, looking like we get something like 2.48 to the minus eight. And now we're already in centimeters, which is good. Again, cubic centimeters is what we're looking for. We then wanna put it into the appropriate length equation, which would be this one. So to calculate the edge length, it would be four times our radius, which is this number here divided by our square root of three. And if we do that times uh, four divided by the square root of three, looks like we end up with uh, 5.72 to the minus eight. Again, these are centimeters. A reminder one more time that this is still a length and because this is a cube, we then would want to cube it to get us into a volume. So the volume here again would be the length cubed, basically taking centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. 5.72 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters cubed. And that's going to get us, it looks like we'll call it 1.8, call it 1.87 times 10 to the minus 22. We also cube the bottom part, which is our cubic centimeters. And that now is our volume that we need for the bottom part. Any questions up to that point? Lastly here, we're just gonna really divide the two numbers. So we're gonna take our grams, which was 2.84 times 10 to the minus 22 grams divided by our volume, which is 1.87 times 10 to the minus 22 cubic centimeters. Here again, the units do not cancel, yielding us like a 1.52 grams per cubic centimeter as the density here of rubidium. Any questions on any of those steps there? So for these unit cells, these are the sort of calculations that you would need to do. And a reminder, again, uh, a variation of that would be sort of working your way backwards, maybe given the density and figuring out something like the uh, length of the cell, um, maybe the mass or maybe uh, the, uh, the volume or something like that, kind of working backwards. Any questions on any of those steps there? Okay, so I think that's going to wrap it here for this chapter, actually. This is just the one we just did. Hopefully they agree with us. Looking good so far, I think. That's good. That's good. They do agree. That's good. 
All right, so uh, we're not going to worry about the rest of this, I think. And again, this is just uh, sort of how they come together in a solid form, how they sort of pack each other uh, into that solid form and sort of a arrangement of how they come together. This is just a picture again of an ionic solid. And you can see from this picture, you do have fairly good repeatable patterns, how they come together in this sort of organized way. And that's very typical again of our crystalline solids, like something like sodium chloride is an example of that. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, that wraps up this chapter here. So we're off to, uh, I think, chapter 10 here. And we're obviously gonna talk about solutions. We're gonna to talk about some properties of solutions. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, sort of a little bit about solubility, why certain solutions uh, really do mix with other ones. Uh, maybe why certain solutions don't mix with other ones. And towards the end, we're gonna talk about some things that are referred to as colligative properties. Uh, things like boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, uh, some factors that affect, you know, the normal sort of boiling points or freezing points of solutions. When we talk about solutions, first off, though, um, you know, a reminder that there is a difference between sort of a solution, which typically has that aqueous symbol, and again, something that's a pure liquid. So typically, as we've talked about, a solution really is made up of two things, right? It's the solute, which is the smaller part of the solution. And usually the solvent, which is the larger part of the solution. So again, if you had a sodium chloride solution, the name of the solution would be the solute. So the sodium chloride here would be the solute and probably water here would be the solvent in this case. You have something that is a pure liquid, it means you really just have one substance by itself, like water, for example. Nothing else mixed in there with it. It's just a pure liquid at that point. So certain sort of liquids are soluble in each other. Sometimes liquids are not soluble in each other. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about sort of liquids and liquids and sort of what happens with that. So when we do mix really two liquids, and they really end up mixing completely. And they're really soluble in each other. Sometimes we, in the terms of sort of liquid and liquid mixing, uh, we sometimes don't refer to it as being soluble, although a lot of times some we do. Um, sometimes we talk about it as being miscible. So when we take two liquids, they are miscible in each other. And what does that mean if we were to look at it in a test tube? So if we put those two liquids in one test tube, it pretty much would look uniformly the same. You wouldn't be able to distinguish what, where one liquid starts and the other one sort of ends. It will all mix really well together. It will all look pretty much the same. What allows these guys to mix together is what we talked about in the previous chapter, those intermolecular forces. So when we take something like ethanol and we take something like water, ethanol looks something like this here. I think I remember organic once or twice, or a lot of times I took it, we'll see. All right, it looks something like this. So that's ethanol there. And water obviously looks like this. And although ethanol is an organic compound and pretty much from like this point backwards, kind of yellow part here. This part of the molecule is pretty much nonpolar. It's all carbons and hydrogens, nothing much going on sort of on this part of the molecule. But what ethanol has is that one little piece there that is that OH group and that OH group right here is a polar group. And it is actually the same OH group that we see there in water. And that OH group is polar. And that means that one side of that bond is going to be more negative and one side is gonna be more positive. Oxygen side here will be more negative. Hydrogen side will be more positive. Identically what we see there with water. 
And now, as we talked about, like with our intermolecular forces, these two nice guys have a way to basically bond with each other through hydrogen bonding, which is a pretty good interaction and means that they will interact very well with each other. Also will mean they will end up like over here where everything mixes, all looks like basically again, one solution. I guess I shouldn't change the color there, but again, looks like all one solution, no different layers or anything happening uh, in that particular test tube. Now we can definitely mix two liquids together that you know end up not mixing very well. And what we will see in that case is something that is referred to as being immiscible with each other. And what we will see is instead of like the case of ethanol and water, we'll actually see layering happening. So we'll see these different layers that will basically occur in that particular case. And <clears throat> For example, if we take CCL4 carbon tetrachloride with water. So if we have our water molecule over here, which again is polar, negative, positive, and we take something like carbon tetrachloride and we just sketch the good Lewis structure there for a second without all the dots on the chlorine. Imagine they're there. But what we do see is this is a symmetrical geometry we have exactly the same element on the outside of all those things. As you surely remember, this guy is going to be a nonpolar molecule, while water obviously is a polar molecule. This creates some problems because water is going to try to use its hydrogen bonding, right? So water is gonna go, cool, I wanna do some hydrogen bonding. Carbon tetrachloride is going to go, I would like to do some dispersion forces. What does that mean? It means, you know, honestly, for the short period of time, they might be able to interact for a little bit, very small, small amount of time. But over the long period of time, they really have no long range way of keeping that interaction basically going. And remember that those dispersion forces are very weak forces. And again, that's why eventually what will happen is we will get this sort of separation out of these different sort of phases in that uh, or layers in that sort of test tube. Because again, they, they really don't have that long range way of interacting well with each other. This is also why water is not necessarily always the best solvent. Uh, for things. And um, in certain cases, they really won't mix very well. So this brings up a really important point about sort of solubility and how things sort of work and mix with each other. It's this idea of like dissolves like. And what that means is pretty much things that have very similar intermolecular forces are ways to interact with each other that are very similar. They are very soluble in each other. Things that don't have ways to interact with each other really well are not going to be soluble in each other. So for example, when we think about things being soluble or miscible in each other, things that are polar and polar, they're good. They're gonna be pretty good. Things that are nonpolar, and nonpolar will actually be good as well because they both will be using dispersion forces. Ionic guys and polar guys will be good. The one thing where we get things that are typically insoluble in each other is when we try to cross over and go polar and nonpolar, not so good. And that is the case that we see here are our water and carbon tetrachloride. So like dissolves like again, meaning if we got things that have similar sort of interactions, they should really interact really well with each other. And we should expect to see some sort of solubility in one another. Any questions on that there? Here's again, an example here. And again, you see some different layering occurring, indicating that these guys most likely are not going to be miscible in each other. A reminder as well, when you do mix something that's sort of organic and something that is uh, 
sort of water-based or aqueous, typically the organic eye is up on top layer and the inorganic eye or the aqueous layer is usually the bottom layer when you look at it in a test tube. So let's talk a little bit about some examples of solubility in water. Ionic substances are soluble in water. So things like sodium chloride, ammonium nitrate, we do expect it to be very soluble in water. Why is that? Well, those guys are pretty much gonna break apart into ions in solution. And pretty much our water molecules are gonna then come about and surround these guys. And the hydrogen part would surround the negative guy because hydrogen part is more positive in water. And that is what we talked about ion dipole interaction, right? And that allows those things really to dissolve as we maybe talked about earlier. Um, basically what happens is it gets all mixed up in the water sort of network and to our eyes we look like, wow, it's gone, it disappeared, it's no longer there. It's really still there. It just really got sucked into a bunch of waters where we sort of, in a sense, lose uh, visibility of it. And we know it's there because obviously if we heat it up, as we've talked about as well, you would, if you started to heat up some, say, sodium chloride solution or something like that, you essentially would then start to basically dissolve off all these waters. All these waters would eventually kind of evaporate away. And at that point, our intramolecular force, the attractive force between the positive ion and the negative ion will come back together and you would see that solid reform, right? So again, a reminder that that's really a, a sort of physical change that's occurring when we dissolve like a solid in water, uh, not a chemical change, because it's still really there. We just can't sort of see it. Other things like sugar and ethanol, as we just saw, are uh, also soluble in water. Why is something like ethanol soluble in water is what we just saw there with the OH group. Why is something like sugar soluble in water? Well, sugar is a fairly large molecule, but we'll see a picture of sugar in a second, but pretty much sugar is loaded with OH groups. And everywhere on sugar that there's an OH group, it gives it an opportunity really to interact with water and do some hydrogen bonding, which is why we know when we take some sugar, obviously in water, it dissolves, right? They're very soluble in each other because of that. So you can have things that, you know, for the, some part of it, have a part of the molecule that's sort of nonpolar. But, you know, if they do have sort of a part that is polar, like an OH group or something like that, it does give it the ability to interact well with water. Now there is a limit, a lot of organic things are like this, where there's a, this big sort of carbon hydrogen part. And usually when you get, you know, about six or more carbons attached there, you know, kind of going this way, and even if you have an OH group, about six or more carbons, the solubility really does start to decrease a lot. And that's because what you're essentially doing is when you build out a lot of carbons and hydrogens, you essentially got this big part of the molecule, which is nonpolar, no real good way to interact with water. And then you got this lonely little kind of OH group over here trying to interact with water. It's what is sometimes referred to as steric hindrance. It gets in the way, basically. This big part of the molecule kind of gets in the way of water being able to sort of interact with that. So, you know, even though we do have some things that have nonpolar parts and sort of polar parts and things with a about six or less carbons are usually fairly soluble in water, as long as they have something like an OH group or something like that. When we do build out that sort of nonpolar part, it gets bigger and bigger. It gets to a point where it just sort of gets in the way and it's not very efficient in being able to dissolve because essentially you have kind of a bigger nonpolar non -polar part than polar part. Any questions on that there? So I think we maybe saw this a little bit earlier, but again, this is essentially hydrogen bonding. This again is methanol. Again, a small sort of nonpolar part, but still has that polar part OH group, allowing it to hydrogen bond with water and interact with water very well. And that's our ethanol, same idea, even though technically speaking, this part is kind of nonpolar, 
is not so big that it prohibits this part from still interacting with water. Again, this part that I just circled here, as you build out more and more carbons, again, six or more solubility definitely drops a lot. So what about sort of water and oil? Do they mix? And the answer is obviously no, they do not. Because pretty much oil is nothing more than a super long chain of carbons and hydrogen, pretty much non-interrupted carbons and hydrogens. They're so long chains, we do what is sometimes referred to as fracking, fracking it, which basically means we break it up into smaller amounts like eight carbons, like octane, like gas, right? And other sort of uh, organic sort of molecules. But because it's really just this long chain of carbons and hydrogens, the carbon hydrogen bonds we talked about when bonding is a nonpolar bond. So you got this guy that essentially wants to use only dispersion forces. You have water, as we talked about, that basically wants to use hydrogen bonding. And in order for things to really be sort of soluble in something like water, you need sort of a side, you need to replace basically water and water interactions with very similar interactions. And if you have something that's really big like oil and doesn't really have anywhere to do any type of like hydrogen bonding or anything like that, um, it can only mix for a short period of time. And again, over the long period of time, it has no way to maintain those things. And it's very hard to get that really big molecule into the sort of all the waters and stuff like that. So that does bring us back to that idea as we've been talking about of like dissolves like. So again, seeing things with similar intermolecular forces or basically behave similarly and be very sort of soluble as well. And that brings us to sort of an idea of hydrophilic versus hydrophobic. And I think we will lay it up here right now for the 